Hey legends, welcome to the Glitch and Grow Lab, your VIP pass to a space where we spark big ideas and glitch the game. Today, we're diving into neurodesign, so grab a coffee, or whatever your go-to-drink of choice is, get cozy, and let's disrupt the ordinary together. We often think of genius as something that happens entirely inside our heads, a spark of insight, a flash of brilliance. We credit the brain alone for its remarkable feats of creativity and problem solving. We invest heavily in software, in training, in tools designed to make our minds sharper and faster. But you know what? We're missing a crucial piece of the puzzle. We forget that thinking doesn't happen in a vacuum. Our brains are constantly in conversation with the world around us. The space we inhabit, its light, its sounds, its textures, is not a passive backdrop. It's actually an active participant in our cognitive processes, shaping our thoughts in ways we're only just beginning to understand. This is the central idea behind a field called neurodesign, the science of intentionally shaping our environments to help our brains do their best work. Leaders are always searching for an edge. They invest in leadership training, team building exercises, sophisticated project management software. All these tools are valuable. Yet, one of the most powerful levers remains largely overlooked, the sensory environment. This is the realm of sensory ergonomics, the practice of tuning the physical workspace to support cognitive and emotional states. It's about understanding that our senses are the gateways to our brain, and by carefully managing what comes through those gateways, we can guide our teams toward greater focus, collaboration, and creativity. Imagine, if you will, a team struggling with a complex analytical task that demands deep concentration. A leader might notice distracting chatter, visual clutter, they might create a deep work zone and area with acoustic panels to dampen sound, minimalist decor to reduce visual noise, and individual lighting controls. This isn't about micromanaging. It's about providing the cognitive resources the team needs to succeed. We have an intuitive sense that beautiful things make us feel good. We are drawn to elegant product design, stunning works of art, and well-crafted user interfaces. But this isn't just a matter of taste. Our attraction to beauty is a deep-seated neurological phenomenon. A region deep inside the brain, the orbitofrontal cortex, lights up. This is an area associated with pleasure and reward. It triggers the release of dopamine, a neurotransmitter that makes us feel good and, crucially, motivates us to seek out that experience again. This dopamine of design has profound implications for the digital tools we use every day. Is it clunky, ugly, and confusing? Or is it elegant, intuitive, and satisfying to use? Using a poorly designed application is a source of constant, low-grade friction. It creates cognitive dissonance and frustration, depleting our limited reserves of mental energy. Now contrast that with a beautifully designed digital interface. The experience is frictionless. Actions flow logically one to the next. The visual elements are pleasing to the eye. This positive aesthetic experience does more than just make us feel good in the moment. The dopamine hit we get reinforces our engagement. It makes us want to use the tool. It makes the work itself feel less like a chore and more like a satisfying activity. Good design, in this sense, is not a luxury. It is a fundamental component of motivation and productivity. It reduces cognitive load, allowing us to dedicate more of our mental resources to the actual task, not to figuring out the tool. Leaders and designers should take this to heart. When choosing software for a team or designing a new product, aesthetics should be a key consideration, right alongside functionality. These are not superficial details. They are direct inputs into the brain's reward system. By prioritizing beautiful and intuitive design, we are essentially hacking our own brain chemistry. We are creating digital environments that not only help us get work done, but also make us feel good while doing it fostering a virtuous cycle of engagement and performance. Our culture glorifies the non-stop hustle. We see busyness as a badge of honor. We equate long hours with high output. We try to power through complex problems, believing that sheer force of will can conquer any cognitive challenge. But the brain doesn't work that way. It's not a computer that can run indefinitely at maximum capacity. It's a biological organ that operates in cycles of effort and recovery. Pushing it relentlessly without breaks is not a strategy for peak performance. It's actually a recipe for burnout. 
diminished creativity, sloppy thinking. The science is clear. Strategic pauses aren't a sign of weakness, but an essential ingredient for sustained intellectual work. Our brains have two primary modes of thinking. Focused mode, task, positive network, concentrating intently on a problem, analyzing data, writing a report. Diffuse mode, default mode network, daydreaming, letting thoughts connect freely and unexpectedly. True breakthroughs and creative insights rarely happen when we're staring intently at a problem. They often emerge in moments of mental rest, in the shower, on a walk, staring out the window, when the default mode network has a chance to get to work. This is where the power of micro-breaks comes in. A micro-break is a short, restorative pause, lasting anywhere from 30 seconds to a few minutes. It's not about checking email, scrolling social media. A true micro-break involves disengaging completely, standing up to stretch, looking out the window at a distant object to relax your eyes, closing your eyes and taking a few deep breaths. These short interludes allow the brain's attentional systems to reset, reduce the buildup of cognitive fatigue, and replenish the mental energy needed for the next bout of focused work. Now that we understand the principles, how do we put them into practice? Creating a brain-friendly workspace is about making conscious choices that align with our neurological needs. Let's start with light. Light is a powerful biological signal. Maximize exposure to natural daylight. Natural daylight boosts mood and regulates internal clocks. Position your desk near a window if possible. If you rely on artificial light, use tunable LED lighting, letting you change color temperature throughout the day. Bright, cool light for focused morning work. Warmer, softer light for the afternoon to ease the transition toward evening. Sound is another critical element. The complete absence of sound can be just as distracting as a noisy office. Many people find that a gentle, consistent ambient sound can help them focus. This is where biophilic sound comes in. Gentle babble of a brook, soft rainfall, birdsong. These soundscapes mask office chatter and promote calm alertness. Numerous apps provide them. For intense concentration, noise-canceling headphones create a personal sanctuary of focus. The physical arrangement of your space matters immensely as well. Our brains evolved in natural, open environments. They feel most at ease when they can occasionally look up and gaze into the distance. This is known as the savanna effect. In an office, avoid setups where you're facing a blank wall whenever possible. Arrange your desk so you have a long view across the room or out a window. Periodically looking up relaxes eye muscles and gives your brain a micro moment of spatial expansion, which can reduce mental fatigue and spark new connections. Finally, bring nature in. Incorporating natural elements has been shown to reduce stress, increase creativity, and improve well-being. This can be as simple as a few potted plants, natural wood textures, and images of nature. These aren't just decorative touches. They're evidence-based design interventions that leverage our deep evolutionary connection to the natural world to create an environment where our minds can truly thrive. In today's world, the workspace is not just a physical location. For many of us, our primary environment is the digital landscape of our computer screens. The same principles of neurodesign apply to an office. They also apply to our desktops, our software, our online habits. Our digital spaces are often cluttered, chaotic, filled with endless notifications that hijack our attention. Crafting a high-performance digital workspace is about curating this environment, minimizing distraction, supporting deep, focused work. Start by decluttering your digital desktop. Organize files into a clear folder structure. Keep only essential applications visible. Use a simple, non-distracting wallpaper. Next, tame notifications. Every ping, every pop-up, every red badge is an engineered interruption. Context switching destroys productivity. Turn off non-essential notifications on your computer and phone. Schedule specific times to check email and messages. Finally, consider the aesthetics and ergonomics of the tools you use. Use focus mode. Use full screen mode. Customize the font size. Customize the background color. Apps that offer a dark mode can be easier on the eyes. By taking control of your digital workspace, you're no longer a passive victim of its distractions. You become the architect of an online environment designed for clarity, focus, and deep thinking. The power of neurodesign is that it is accessible to everyone. You don't need a fancy title or a big budget to begin shaping your environment for better thinking. 
It starts with a simple shift in perspective, recognizing that your mind is not confined to your skull. It's an extended system, interwoven with the spaces you inhabit, the tools you use, and the rhythms you keep. You're constantly thinking with your surroundings. This journey begins with observation. Pay attention to how you feel and think in different environments. Where do you do your best, most focused work? What is it about that space? Is it the quiet, the quality of the light, the view from the window? Conversely, where do you feel most distracted, drained, or uninspired? Notice the sensory inputs in that environment. Is the lighting harsh? Is there constant background noise? Is your screen cluttered with notifications? Start a small journal and note connections between place and thought. From this awareness, make small, deliberate changes. Try noise-canceling headphones or a green noise app. Take a five-minute daylight walk. Spend 15 minutes organizing your desktop. Each small change is an experiment. This iterative process of observing, experimenting, and adjusting is the core of design thinking applied to your own mind. Ultimately, we can actively enhance our intelligence, creativity, and focus by curating the world around us. We can build physical and digital sanctuaries that protect our attention, design workflows that honor rest, and choose tools that delight. By blending neuroscience with a designer's mindset, we build environments that help our minds come alive. You are the architect. The blueprint is in your hands. It's time to start building. Now it's your turn to disrupt the ordinary, grow extraordinary. What's your next move to glitch the game? Drop it in the comments, smash that like button, subscribe, and hit the bell to keep sparking with the Glitch and Grow Lab. Let's rewrite reality together.